I'm going to begin by offering uh, a perspective about whales and our relationship to them before I begin uh, describing the work I do and some things to think about. Modern whales, the species we see today, they've been in existence 7 to 30 million years. And they're complex social animals uh, who possess brains anywhere from four to seven times the size of our own. And you think about our fossil record for Homo sapiens, I believe it goes back roughly 200,000 years. Uh, so it's a stark contrast. And in this 200,000 year overlap, uh, it was really only 60 or 70 years ago during the height of whaling that we decimated most whale populations to 2% of their original size. And the collective fondness and concern that exists today for whales is only as old as I am, a mere 40 years. And a lot has happened in that 40 years, and I think most notable was uh, a global ban on whaling uh, on, in 1985. And with that global ban, uh, three countries continue to hunt whales, either in direct violation or through uh, loopholes in the regulations. And as their practices continued, the anti-whaling movement gained in strength and as it gained in strength, so too did the resistance to change within these countries. A lot of people on the outside putting pressure on these countries. And, and over the last 25 years, they're still hunting whales, and more than 30,000 whales have been killed this way. And so I was a part of that polarized uh, pro-anti-dynamic for a while, and I gave it up 15 years ago. And 10 years ago, I began my journey to explore ways that I could peacefully inspire change within these countries and basically recreate the events that occurred here in the States and all over the world. All, many other countries were big whaling countries and they stopped. And the, the change came from within and I wanna facilitate that. And I didn't know how to do that, but I, I explored, um, I dedicated myself for 10 years on this journey. And the breakthrough moment for me, this inspiration of what I can share as a photographer in these countries um, happened uh, six years ago in the South Pacific. I was photographing humpback whales underwater and um, it's not up yet, good. Um, and I was observing a whale in front of me, uh, floating at the surface on snorkel. And as I was watching this whale, I felt a firm but gentle nudge on my shoulder, on the back of my shoulder. And I thought perhaps I bumped into the boat because it was just floating next to me, or I thought it was. And I turned to look, and instead it was a 50-ton female humpback whale, about 55 feet long. And bigger than a school bus, and she had extended her 15-foot-long pectoral fin. Here it is. This is life-size. It's about 15 feet long, weighs well over 1,000 pounds, and she was so careful just to touch me gently to let me know she was behind me. And I turned to look. By the way, there's no bruise or anything. And I turned to look, and I was struck because something happened that I've never experienced before. I was never been that close to a well underwater, eye to eye. And my eyes met her eye, and I saw a very calm, mindful gaze looking back at me. And I trembled a lot just because of how gentle she was and how mindful. And it was evident to me that here's a conscious being looking at me. And I saw in that instant what I need to share in these countries, uh, these calm, mindful gazes of the whale, <laughs> these very close distances around 10 feet, and to do it to scale. And it started with the idea of making them as portraits and then I do later do full body composites. And so that began my journey, and with this inspiration, I felt it was really, it had tremendous conservation value, and that I couldn't turn my back on it. No one has ever attempted to make life-size photographs of whales. And um, I basically have come to develop uh, four components to doing this successfully. The first is time. You have to spend entire seasons with whales, up to three months with specific populations. And the second element is consistency. Um, so everything I do is consistent. Uh, my behavior in the water is slow and predictable. I'm motionless most of the time. I'm on the surface on snorkel. And this applies to my vessel as well. I use the same vessel as much as possible so that um, the whales become familiar with it as an individual, the acoustic signature, the whole characteristics. And visually, I'm the same, uh, the wetsuit, fins, mask. And the idea is to cultivate familiarity trust and curiosity among individuals recited over time. And this has really never been done before, and I'll share more why it has to be done to make life-size photographs, that, which leads to the third is proximity. This was very hard for me and kept me up late at night during the early development stages of this project. I have to be very close to a whale to make these photographs, six feet. Um, 
I started at 10, and then I just stopped taking photographs at 10 because they weren't rendering life-size. And so I wait now until they come to me six feet away. And, um, and during these times, their pectoral fin, such as these, will pass underneath my body. Uh, their fluke will pass this far away. And I tell people, sometimes people are with me, if you don't move, it doesn't matter if the whale's eye is 40 feet away from its tail. As long as you don't move, they'll line you up and go right by you. And so I've come to really uh, trust them. And, and something else is happening. It's like this, this, you know, 40 years of swimming with whales, that's how long we've been doing it. And, um, and, and I feel myself going deeper into this journey of whale and human relationships. The final element is data capture, for lack of a better term. I use a camera that can capture as much information as possible. Right now, I use a 50 megapixel camera underwater, and it's still not enough, but it, it's getting the job done. And so I had this powerful vision. Um, I, I couldn't turn my back on it. I've been searching for a long time to find a peaceful way to inspire change. And just as I came, had this profound breakthrough moment, uh, Japan had announced that in the next phase of their um, whaling program, scientific whaling program, they were going to include these whales. And I felt that I couldn't turn my back on them and that I really need to continue my work with them full time. I had a job at a marine mammal research lab, and so I, you couldn't do this on two-week vacations. So I uh, basically sold everything I owned, left my job there as an office manager, started a nonprofit to bring in funding, and I raised enough funding to carry out 128 days of field work over two field seasons with this population. And out of those 28 days, I would only have one to scale portrait. And the idea for me was to bring these to Japan, and you know that journey still continues. But that was all I had. And it, I wasn't really prepared for how hard it was. I'm, I'm, when I'm with whales, I'm very patient and relaxed, and, and they're, they're the least of my worries. It's just life, <laughs> you know, and making this happen. And I felt the pressure uh, of it ending. And, and as the season was ending, well, before I go into that, I'm gonna share with you this was a composite event. During those 128 days, I only had one composite event. And when you make a full body life-size photograph of a whale, you have to take a series of photos along their body, and then you blend them together into a seamless photo. That's the only way you can get any meaningful resolution, and that inspiration came from NASA's Mariner Space Program when they first began sending back photo mosaics. But you saw the portrait, and that was all I had, and I was really going through a rough time. Uh, I, I trusted some people that let me down, and I was making a lot of mistakes, and I, I like the theme of mistakes today for Molly, and I can really relate to it. I made a lot. And uh, it also cost me my marriage to my first and only love, and um, I didn't want that to be in vain. I, I, you know, it, my work broke us up, and I wanted to, uh, I didn't want to fail. I, wanted, I really believed in this. And I had a really hard night one night. Um, I didn't sleep at all. I was struggling with anxiety and depression, and really, um, just really didn't feel like continuing, and, and it, it was you know, just really lonely uh, doing this work, first of all. And uh, I went out sleep deprived on the water the next day, and um, I found this whale. And he's a one month old, and we named him Beethoven, and uh, the other whale I named Mozart. And um, the, I, I was photographing him and his mother, and here's mom. And as I was looking at mom, I took a photograph of her, and as I was photographing her, I felt a presence on my back. And um, this whale, Beethoven, he swam up behind me and rested the underside of his uh, chin and his belly on my back. As he was, we were both at the surface, and he rested it on my back, and then he gently took his left peck fin and wrapped it around me. And we just stayed there together. I was breathing through my snorkel, and he was on his, you know, breathing through his blowhole. I didn't want to startle them. They won't hurt you uh, intentionally. I mean, I think it's very rare, but they could hurt you accidentally, so I didn't want to startle them. And the person who was in the water with me gently pulled me aside. And I don't know, that, that really did something for me. It just really, I really needed that. <laughs> 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 so. so I came home. I stayed to the bitter end, uh, and I, I, I calculated how much money I would need to get home Back to the States, I didn't have a home. I was, I, I'd been staying with my mom for the last three years while I do this full time. And I took that collection, and here, there's Mozart. I sold my underwater camera and uh, housing to have this printed. Now, like I said, everything is expensive about these creatures on their scale. And I began exhibiting my work um, 
for the next two years full-time, uh, locally and abroad, and it would take two years for me to find just two individuals who shared my vision and wanted to see to its continuation. And that happened last year. And this, a month ago, or a year ago to this month, and I started my field work again. And I'm not sure what the next slide is. I think it's black, that's good. Um, <laughs> um, and so uh, I was invited to exhibit my work in Norway. This will be my first Whaling Nation exhibition. I was very excited. And my funders wanted me to expand my portfolio. So I started with uh, the sperm whales in the West Indies. There are five resident families in the West Indies and I spent time with all of them. And I only had six weeks though, which isn't enough time, but I had no choice. I had to make a go of it. I hadn't picked up a camera in two years. And so uh, I spent six weeks there and had one exceptional day with a remarkable family. They're matriarchal like elephants. And that one day, uh, this family, this is uh, a 15 year old male, he's the son, and uh, he's very uh, inquisitive and exceptional in his behavior. And I spoke with the biologist, uh, Shane Jarrow, who's finishing his PhD on this family. Uh, so he basically made the next phase of my work possible. And this was my most memorable encounter with him. Uh, he's 10 or 30 feet long and weighs about 30 tons. And um, on my second encounter, he swam towards me with his mouth open, and that's normally a threat display. But uh, because I knew him as an individual, I wasn't terribly concerned, and I remained motionless until his head, his head's about this big, and it stopped right here. And um, some speculate that he may have been echolocated on me, where you can see your organs and your bones and everything. And then he stopped doing that, and then he came forward and pushed up against me, and I've never touched a whale. I don't want to encourage playful behavior, nor do I want to startle them, but I had to push off of him. And as I pushed off of him, he leaned over and swam forward with his mouth still open to meet my eyes. His mouth was still wide open, and my, I was flat, and I had to look down to make sure my fins weren't touching his lower jaw. And I didn't want to just encourage any playful behavior, so I would look down, and I would see his open mouth. You would see squid tentacles stuck in there. And... Uh, you have to understand, he, he, well, first of all, um, sperm whales have been in existence 20 million years. They possess the largest brain ever to exist on our planet, up to 21 pounds. He's at the top of the food chain, pretty much, and he's the largest tooth carnival on the planet. And he's engaging me in the most friendly and inquisitive way, taking great care not to harm me. And I was so grateful for him to, to have this encounter with him, and I'm hoping to reunite with him this year to have it filmed. Uh, I made a five-image composite out of him. This is six by 10 feet. That was all I could do, he was too close to me. And he ended the encounter after this series and he literally just disappeared 3,000 feet below me. And so I came home, great, we have photos for Norway. Um, I'm so grateful. And then another opportunity came up. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one more story. This is his younger brother. He's two and a half years old. I spent almost an hour with him while his mom was 3,000 feet below us foraging. And I made my first successful composite. So this was a breakthrough moment for me. I wasn't even sure if this was possible, but I knew it needed to be tried because um, no one may ever attempt to do this, and I, I didn't want to be responsible for turning my back on it. And honestly, we're the only generation right now that's going to be able to do anything to protect these animals and to ensure they're still around. Uh, future generations won't have the opportunities that we have now, so very grateful for that moment. Okay, yeah, so... With two months before our exhibition in Norway, uh, we received funding from the same kind individuals who uh, wanted me to work with the most heavily hunted whale in the world, and that's the minke whale. They are not only the most heavily hunted, but the, many biologists consider them to be the most friendly and inquisitive wild carnivore on the planet. And she was no exception. And uh, all the photographs you see here of minke whales are of her. I spent five days with her. Uh, in particular at Anchorage, uh, where we anchored for five days on the Great Barrier Reef. And I would wake up in the morning and see her swimming around the boat, and I would sit on the stern with my coffee, and she would actually stick her head up out of the water to look at me, wondering when I'm going to get in the water. I would spend up to six hours a day with her, photographing her, making my composites. Uh, she's outside the venue here. This is her. And uh, I would be in the shower shivering, trying to warm up. At the end of the day, the sun had set. And I'd look out the porthole, and I'd see the dorsal fin go by. <laughs> <laughs> she was incredible. And then most notably, uh, I had to switch vessels at sea. And um, I was photographing her in the morning. My vessel showed up to pick me up. The little dinghy took me over, and she followed us over. 
uh, unpacked, grabbed my camera, went back in and kept photographing her. Um, she's incredible. She made it possible. Um, let's see, there's one of the photos of her eye. Again, this is with a 50 megapixel camera, portrait lens, uh, probably three feet away, so you get everything. It's really exciting to see that level of detail. Uh, there's the composite. It's seven by 30 feet. This is the first time it's been printed here <laughs> at EG, so I'm really excited. We're looking at making a continuous print to bring to Norway in April. And uh, so I'm very grateful. That took five months to finish, by the way. And uh, a lot of work, 300 photographs of, of the best. So. so here I was at sea working on the photographs on the Great Barrier Reef. I put them on disc. We overnighted them to Oslo to be printed. And three weeks later, I joined um, our debut exhibition in Oslo. And that was exciting. I partnered with our uh, several NGOs from uh, Norway and London. None of us knew what to expect. We were going in uh, not to polarize the issue any further. And we wanted to see what would happen if we just peacefully shared whales on their scale. And none of us were prepared. Um, we had a two-day two debut exhibition in Oslo, and we had 2,000 people in attendance. And uh, we received television, exposure, media exposure, and all print media exposure, magazines, newspapers, all of it was positive. And what I saw what was happening was I w by giving them freedom to explore their own emotions, we were drawing in their curiosity and their fascination. And I thought it would be the photographs that would compel audiences. That's, that was my only vision, but they want to know the stories. And I've had to become a public speaker. I was not a public speaker. And so I began sharing my stories and telling you the stories I've told them and how gentle they are and how close we are together and, and doing this. And there's still, still much work to do. I, I've come back from the Arctic Circle uh, last month for our third exhibition. It's up for three months at the Polar Museum. And that was exciting because it's a city with an active whaling fleet. And again, the, the response was positive. So we're making inroads. This is all new, all experimental, and um, you know a lot remains to be seen in the future uh, of this project. And um, um, yeah, and I, I, I'm going to close with a, a quote from Carl Sagan that always stays with me. He said, "We are a way for the cosmos to know itself." And I look at that as we are one small aspect of the cosmos becoming self-aware. And when I think of seven to thirty million years of evolving culture ending in our lifetime. It's an awful feeling, and it's a, a, and we will lose a significant part of ourselves if that happens, and to never know what what to never know their culture. And so, it's really my hope that I'll be able to continue shaping a new model for inspiring change, not only in Norway, Iceland, and Japan, but a new model to address all the issues that uh, uh, marine mammal species face worldwide. Because whaling is the easiest issue to fix. Uh, the other issues are far more daunting, and we may not even be able to end whaling, but I want to find out if we can. If we can, there just might be hope for the future for these creatures and, and drawing attention to all the other issues that they face. So thank you very much. Thank you.